morning, everybody. Hey, man, this is uh, what a, what an awesome Sunday. I you know, I, I work at camp, so I see, man, we see 500 churches come through every year, and I'll be real, what y'all have here is really unique. Um, what you have with the student ministry is unique. Um, you, there there are so many churches that don't have students. I don't have many students at all just because of the age demographic or whatever, you know, they just don't have a lot. And y'all have so many students and so many solid students and so many solid people that are working with the students. I, really, what y'all have here is very rare and very unique. And so this Sunday, man, y'all being able to take a Sunday out and, man, let these guys lead music, which... They did awesome. I mean, that was, that was incredible. Uh, so, so good, man. It's, it's just exciting to see young people that are, I mean, really following Christ. And, and obviously, we're not stupid. We know not all the teenagers that come through here are passionately following Christ, you know. And, you know, for all of us, a walk with Christ is a struggle, a fall down, a get up, a fall down, a get up, a we need grace all day, every day. Um, and so, you know, I want to do something that's kind of unique this morning, uh, pretty unusual, and one of the reasons it's unusual for your church is because your church is solid, um, which is, you know, typically you guys preach through books of the Bible, as you should. Uh, and that's one of the marks of being a solid church is that you're expositionally preaching through books of the Bible. Uh, and so that's, man, that's the way it should be done. And so I'm going to pause on y'all's uh, expositional study. And I know you guys are in Luke. Y'all were looking at the second coming last week. But I want to pause, man, and just talk from... Uh, the perspective of, of someone who's been working in youth ministry for, what, 21 years now uh, at the same spot. And I want to just talk about some of the things that I've learned. And specifically, I want to talk to y'all that are parents. Uh, and I'm, I'm a parent. My son is back in the back. And uh, I, we have two other kids at home. And um, even if you're not a parent, I mean, all of us, regardless of your age or station in life, man, we should all be investing in this next generation. So I just want to talk for a few minutes about some things that I've learned over the last couple of decades just ministering to students. Uh, so I, I work at Snowbird, and if you don't know what that is, you know, it's a high adventure Christian wilderness camp. So we see students come every week, every weekend, every week, every weekend. We got students there right now. As soon as these leave, more will come. So it's constant revolving door of students. And so, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of students we see every year, and we take them mountain biking, whitewater rafting, and we have tons of big swings and towers and lakes and rivers that we're on all the time. You know, in years past, we've done rock climbing and ice climbing, all, all kind of crazy stuff. So it's, man, it's an awesome, awesome. I mean, it's pretty much the dream job. I get to mountain bike and talk about Jesus. And so, I mean, it's a really sweet gig. But what I do there specifically is, is risk management. Um, and so it's a pretty big job. Uh, you know, thinking about managing the risks for 550 teenagers while they're doing whitewater rafting and things like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty full time, but you know, and so anytime I tell anybody, I'm going to do risk management at this big camp, they're like, oh, dang, that's a big job. But it's, it's kind of not, it's not what you think. It's think in your mind, where do you think most kids get hurt at a, at a student camp? Because I've found that very few people do kind of accurate risk analysis just in life. You know, a, a lot of times we do the bulk of our risk analysis based on our feelings, Really, you know, uh, based on our fears, like if something feels risky, we're like, oh, I'm going to avoid that. And, and usually that's, that's good. Like your gut feeling, if you don't feel right about someone, you don't feel right about a dog, usually you're pretty on. But a lot of times we're off. You know, a lot of times we need to trust the data more than we need to trust our feelings. For example, y'all been swimming in the ocean. What has come to mind if you're swimming in the ocean? What's the one fear that enters your mind? It's sharks, absolutely. It's sharks, shark attacks. But did you know, over a 17-year study, you are more likely to be killed by a vending machine than a shark? In fact, you're <laughs> twice as likely to be killed by a vending machine than a shark? In the U.S., in the U.S. Statistically, you are more likely to be killed by falling out of bed or by constipation. <laughs> what a way to go. Or not go. Uh, but... Or you're more likely to be killed by your bathtub, by your staircase, by falling out of a tree, statistically, than by a shark. So why do we worry more about sharks than our bathtub? It's the images. It's the fear. 
we see blood in the water. We saw Jaws. We saw Jaws too, you know, and after that, they got weird, so we didn't see any more. But, you know, like, <laughs> seriously, like, these images, these stories, they, they stick in our head and they override the data. You know what I'm saying? Like, our, they, the fear overrides what's real a lot of times. You, you want to know what the most dangerous thing is at Snowbird? The stairs. We send 550 kids down the river every week, and more kids get hurt on the stairs. That's it. P more people get hurt driving to camp than at camp. More people get hurt walking to the climbing tower than on the climbing tower. Like, we're off on our risk assessment. You know, but if you think about it, the reason these things are fun, like a climbing tower or something like that, is because it gives us a feeling of risk without the real danger. Like our feelings say, risky, risky, but the data says safety, safety. You know what I'm saying? So I think the reason that our feelings are so powerful in overriding the data and the truth really is because we don't vet our feelings the way we vet arguments and data. You know, we, we really put numbers to the test, but we don't stop and kind of vet and, and analyze our feelings. They just kind of slip in. They feel valid, so they're immediately trusted. But, you know, th the scripture I in Galatians, it says, we do what we want to do. We're motivated by wants primarily, and we know that. that think, look at how we eat. We're, we're not eating based on some risk-reward analysis. Like, we, we eat what we want to eat, right? And so we're people that are motivated by desires primarily. So let, let me just, one of the things I've learned from working at a youth camp for the last 20 years is most parents aren't doing an accurate risk assessment for their kids. A lot of times, like uh, their preteens, their teenage kids, even Christian parents, I think, the fear overrides the real risk a lot of times with parenting to where we fear things like our kids not having opportunity, like our kids lacking physical safety. We fear our kids not fitting in with the right friend group or having acceptance or feeling that acceptance. Or we fear them not getting married or, or not having someone to be with. And I, and I think some of these things are legit, but too often these we fear and address these things primarily. When the real risk that's out there that we should be combating and addressing is, is different. It's we, sh we should really fear them finding their identity in something other than Christ. We should fear the idolatry that comes with them finding their identity in how they look and what they're good at. We should fear them finding their identity in sports more than we fear them not having the self-confidence to kick that ball in the net kind of thing. I, I think we should fear their emotional buy-in to worldly philosophy. And, and primarily, you know, the thing that we should really address the most is there, there's a possibility that students can be right here in these seats, that they can be around Christ and not in Christ. Because Judas was around Christ for three years, I mean solid, and not in Christ. You know, the data will tell us the next phase of life for, for you guys, for teenagers, the next phase of life for y'all is where most young people fall off the map. Uh, the best research I, I could find says that 70% of 17 to 19-year-olds, Christian, church attending, you know, 19, we'll, we'll at least say church attending, maybe not Christian, but 70% of church attending students uh, that are 17 to 19, they leave church right after high school, 70%. Now, you get 35% of those back. So, but essentially, 45%-ish of high school kids leave the church permanently after high school. That's it. Like, they've come. They've sat right here. 45%, almost half, leave permanently. 35% leave temporarily and come back. Only 30% stay faithfully, essentially. Why is that, y'all? Like, because at this point, you think they would be, like, They'd have so much momentum coming from a church, coming from a family, you know? So my wife is, uh, she's from the mountains. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm from Columbus, Georgia. She's from East Tennessee. So she's from the mountains, and she will tell you that Mount, she will say this, so I'm not trashing my wife. She's, she would tell you that mountain folks are a little trashier than other folks, and so she likes things that are just different. So for Mother's Day, I said, hey, Mama, what, what you want to do for Mother's Day? And she said, can can we go to a dirt track race? And I said, you're right, we can go to a dirt track race. And so 
for Mother's Day, we went to this dirt track race, and uh, it, was, it was cool. We went to down where I'm from, so we went to the East Alabama Motor Speedway, and it is everything you think it is, like just dirt track race and everything you'd think an Alabama dirt track race would be. Anyway, so the dirt track races, they don't start like you think. So, uh, you know, normal races, a lot of times we see them on TV. Everybody kind of lines up. They're behind the starting line like this, and they either get the flag or they get the lights. Ding, ding, ding. You know, and then they, what? And they hit the road, right? Well, dirt track races aren't like that because they just, they just spin in place and not go anywhere. What they do, actually, on these races is they get them out on the track. And they start going around the track and around the track until they're in the right order and everybody's straight. And then they're like, all right, and they wave this flag that means in a lap we're going to get rolling. And so you can hear the engines just as they're coming around for this last lap. And when they come around that last turn, man, it's just like spectacular. Because first off, it's all these engines are just screaming. And they come right by. And this cloud of just mud, you know, just like (laughs) just hits you in the face. And it's you can't breathe. It's Mother's Day. It's Mother's Day is what it is. It's awesome. And so like the but. What's happening is these guys, when they, when they hit the starting line, they're going 100. You know, and it's just like, whoa, 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 right on the start. And that's what we think our students should be. That's what y'all should be. Coming out of solid families, a solid church, we, y'all should start into life with a lot of momentum, but we're not, statistically. Why, why is that? Because the stats indicate we're off track. And I think we're off on their needs, so uh, we're off on the risks, so we're off on their needs. What your student needs most is not social integration. They need Christ. They need Jesus. They need a solid grounding in Christ, in an identity, not in their sports or their looks. They need it in in Jesus. Ideally, from a solid, loving family that pushes them to Christ. But students, not all y'all have that. And that's all right. You can still follow and pursue after Christ, really. And, you know, that's why a solid youth ministry for a church is crucial. Let me jump into the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 4. Uh, we're just going to go there quick. It, this, again, is not going to be your typical expositional message. We're going to jump around to several different passages of Scripture. So uh, that, that is what it is this morning. So l- let me tell you, you are rich, y'all, in solid students. So the weight on you guys is that you steward that, those riches well. You steward that well. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2, it says this. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required of students. I'm students. It's my brain's program. Moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. This is what it says about us. And, And again, Paul's talking here and he's saying it's we are regarded as servants and stewards. But that's that's all of us that have the gospel message. We are servants and we are stewards this is specifically talking about the apostles, but it applies to ministers today. And let me just speak to youth or, or about youth ministers. Like, youth ministry is not something I ever pictured myself in. And youth ministry is not a, it's not a ministry of prestige. It, no one goes there for the money or the fame. It's, it means a calling a service. It's not a job that you can clock out of at 5 p.m. Ask Mark. You, it's not a job you can clock out. Students don't want to talk during work hours. They want to talk at midnight, you know? And so, but what we get to do with students, man, as this verse says, we get to hold forth the mysteries of God to 14 year olds that is a huge privilege but y'all it's a huge responsibility the privilege is great because we get to hold forth the message of reconciliation as God's ambassador but the responsibility is great because of how impressionable 12 year olds are really it's a hard job to be a student minister it's a hard job to minister to students you know it's not like youth pastors are the JV and pastors are the varsity You know what I'm saying? Student ministry is at least as important, and it might be harder. Because you think about it, it's easier to get away with doing a bad job in student ministry. Because if you minister poorly, you can still get a lot of students to attend. You know, you can still show them a good time. You can still say some true things. And you can still do a bad job. But if you're doing a good job, you have to do the difficult task of applying 
Jewish culture, eternal truths, and biblical warnings to sixth graders. That is hard to do. And, and here's the thing with youth ministry, and, and I'm kind of preaching to the choir because you guys, you have a solid youth ministry here in the church, but these guys don't need a John Piper up here in the pulpit. They don't need a comedian. They don't need a lot of games. What they need are people whose lives have been changed by Jesus, whose lives have been changed initially and in an ongoing daily way by Christ, and then they're just getting out of the way and showing this to students. That's, that's what we need for students. Student ministry is not like, I mean, you got to have this personality. You know, you got to have a guy that really connects. You need to have someone that's life, whose life is changed. That's what students want. St- students want authenticity and Christ. They, they want and need a, a pastor and a youth pastor that are laboring and weeping over the word. It's required of stewards that they be found faithful all the way to the end. And to do so, we as a church, we may have to change our philosophy kind of and, and really our strategy and our definition of success with our kids. If we think about the risk management of it, you know, I, I don't like baseball at all. I like basketball. Um, baseball is, no offense, but it's very boring. It's <laughs> farming baseball. It's, it's, anyway, uh, but I think as far as thinking about success with youth ministry, we need to think more like a minor league manager. You think, how is success, you know, minor leagues, we used to have one in our town, you know, it was like a farm team for the Houston Astros, so we're, it was the Columbus Astros, and basically, it's this AAA ball team that their main goal is, let's prep these players and send them up to the next level. So when you think about a minor league manager, their, their success is not managed by wins and losses. Nobody cares. Their success is not managed by or, or measured by fan attendance. Their success is measured by how many succeed at the next level. So we need to start thinking like minor league, league managers. Success isn't, hey, we got a lot of students here. Check this out. Success is, are they succeeding at the next level? Have we done a good job prepping them for the big leagues, for being involved in a church, for being a faithful minister, a faithful husband, a faithful wife in the next season? But let me say this to your parents, man. It's not the pastors who hold the primary responsibility here. They fill in the gaps, but it's the parents. It's us. We hold the primary disciple-making privilege and responsibility. Let me illustrate. There's a story from the Old Testament. I got to hustle. All right. Let me illustrate. The story from the, from the Old Testament is about Hezekiah, who's a king. He's a king in, uh, in Judah. Now, Hezekiah was king in one of the toughest times to be king because there was this nation that was knocking on their door, the Assyrians. Assyrians, we talked about students yesterday, the Assyrians were brutal, cutting off people's heads, making piles of heads at their gates. They were an awful, brutal people, and they come up to Judah's door and... They're like, we're going to kill all y'all. And, and Hezekiah comes out, and, and he's like, shh, don't say that where the people can hear you. And they're like, oh, they're going to die. All of them are going to die. Don't think your God can save you. He can't. We're going to destroy all of you. And so Hezekiah goes back, and it's this moment of, like, real faith in God. He doesn't cave to these guys like they want. And they have destroyed nation after nation after nation after nation. He just goes and prays before Yahweh. And that night, the Lord kills 185,000 of them. Wow. Wipes out this, I mean, in one night with an angel. Crazy story. Well, then Hezekiah comes back in, and Hezekiah gets really sick. And so the prophet Isaiah, basically, he talks to him and, uh, and tells him, hey, you're going to die. And, and Hezekiah cries out to the Lord, Lord, please save me. Cries out to him like he did with the army. And God gives him 15 more years of life, and it's awesome. Well, then, man, if his life would have stopped there, it would have been just like, man, Hezekiah. He finished well, man. Look at him staying faithful before the army. Look at him staying faithful, praying to the Lord, and the Lord extended his life. But here's where he makes two crucial mistakes. He, some guys from Babylon come. Remember Babylon? We talked about this yesterday. Some guys from Babylon come, the next nation that actually is going to carry off Judah into, into exile. And they come knocking on his door and say, hey, man, I just want to congratulate you on getting well and stuff. And he's like, great. Let me show you around. And so he shows around this nation, Babylon, who incidentally, there's kind of like this 
undertone of maybe he's trying to team up with these guys for protection, which is a big no-no because we're supposed to trust the Lord. So he shows these guys everything. Here's the treasuries. Here's the storehouses. Here's the temple. Here's everything. And Isaiah comes to him later and says, what'd you just do? And he's like, I'll just, just I'll show, him, show these guys around. He said, what'd you show them? And he said, I showed them everything. And basically, Isaiah says, Babylon's going to destroy everything then. They're going to carry off your sons into captivity. And they're going to make your sons, Hezekiah, into eunuchs in the king's palace. Listen to what Isaiah says. We'll have it on the board. It's Second Kings 20. Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up to this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come from you, who you will father, will be taken away and they will be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Y'all know what eunuchs are. They're castrated servants of the king. Any father would be heartbroken and devastated. What should Hezekiah do here? He's cried out to the Lord. 185,000 people dead. He's cried out to the Lord. His life is spared. What does he do? Hezekiah says to Isaiah, verse 19, the word of the Lord you've spoken is good. For he thought, why not? If there'll be peace and security in my days. Yo. You serious? That's all right, I'll be dead by then. He gave me, he gave me a 15-year buffer. You can carry off my sons. What the heck? I mean, Hezekiah had been key in reforming Israel's worship of Yahweh. He cleansed the temple. He reinstated the Passover. He reorganized the priesthood and blew it with his sons. It, it's a pattern. Book of Judges. Another whole generation rises up. The book of Judges is just this downward spiral into just terrible things. And the reason it spirals is because a generation rises up that doesn't know the Lord or what he's done. Eli is a priest of God, and his sons are having sex with the ladies who are, who are offering sacrifices. Samuel, one of the most important prophets of all time, his sons are worthless. And we think, I mean, I would never do that. I'd never be like, oh, that's all right. You'll go ahead and take my kids off. And we, we never do that. Well, of course, we're concerned parents, but are we assessing and addressing the real risk of their soul? Because the real risk of the Babylonian captivity wasn't that they would lose their homes. It was their souls. It was a loss of following Yahweh and serving the Lord, really. You know, uh, I'm going to move quick here, but in our session yesterday, we studied Daniel, right? So Daniel, this guy, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to give you the four-minute fly by overview. But in when we're looking at Daniel, we're looking at that Babylonian captivity because Babylon does come. They do capture these guys. And Daniel and his friends are some of those guys who are castrated and taken away from their family. They're re-educated in the University of Babylon. Basically, they're given new names, new food, new everything because Babylon wanted to assimilate the people of Judah. They wanted to they wanted to erase their identity, their cultural identity, their, their spiritual identity. They wanted to erase Yahweh and their identity, and they wanted them to become Babylonians. They took the best of these guys, and basically, they re-educated them. They renamed them. Remember, Daniel gets the name Belteshazzar. Then you got his three friends who are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and they get names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these names of, of the gods. What, what, what Babylon wanted to do was erase Daniel and create Belteshazzar. New religion, new name, new identity, new way of thinking. And we talked about yesterday's students. The Bible, t Babylon's a legit, literal place, or was, but in the scriptures, it talks about the spirit of Babylon, and it's symbolic of the culture, the age, the sin in the world. And what I talked to your students about yesterday is, Today, people want to merge Christianity and the spirit of Babylon. Our culture, y'all, our culture. And, and I talked to your students yesterday about this. Like the spirit of Babylon wants to champion same-sex union and call it love. Wants to say you can be a Christian and a practicing homosexual. Whole denominations say that. Wants to say you can be a Christian and uh, 
enjoy sinfulness and deny the resurrection, accept all forms of abortion. You can be a Christian and be a different gender, a different sex. You can be whatever sexuality you choose. It's an assimilation, truly. And it'd be easier to recognize if it was a foreign nation, but it's not. It's politicians and NBA players and Instagram accounts and woke preachers. And man, it's tough, y'all. Why am I telling y'all this? And why am I recapping what I said yesterday? It's because your kid, your son, your daughter, they're being raised in a culture that would assimilate them into their way of thinking. Make no mistake, Satan is gunning for your kids. Look at the stats, y'all. For real. If he can merge the spirit of Babylon with the spirit of God in your kid's mind, got them. That, that's it. That's the danger. See, the danger for Daniel and his friends, it wasn't the loss of their security or their homes. It was the loss of their souls. Are we in danger? Of pre- and I'm preaching to the choir. You know, you, you guys know what you're doing with your kids. But for me to be a good steward of this Sunday, I need to ask you, like, are we in danger of protecting our kids primarily against not being in the right school? Like, is, is that our main thing? Like, are we in danger of mainly making sure our kids are well-rounded? Well, we love our kids, so we want them to eat their veggies and get eight hours of sleep and do their homework. We love them, right? But the real risk is not on the home and security level. It's Satan will let them have that if he can have their, their affection, their affection, their love, their wants, their desires. He is a roaring lion. He wants to devour. He's always looking. My, my daughter has a rabbit, three rabbits, actually. Uh, and she was sitting by the fire the other night with this rabbit. She was like, he loves me so much. We were sitting around the fire. She said, he loves me. He looked at him. He's just cuddling up. And I said, he don't love you. <laughs> because that rabbit's like this. I said, he is looking for an opportunity. If he can run, if you take both hands off him, he's running. He's going. Man, I said, and sure enough, he did. He was like, pew! And it took us 45 minutes in the thorns to get that stupid rabbit back. And so, but I think about that, man. This culture, Satan is a roaring lion. He's looking for any opportunity. He's looking for it. Let me give a last couple challenges to you guys. You, parents, you can do this. Your kid doesn't need John Piper up here. They need you. Your kid needs a mom whose life has been changed by Jesus, who will just open the scripture. That's it. Who's involved in their lives, man. Do you want kids that value the word, that fight against the spirit of this culture? Then they need parents that do that with them, with them. Your kids' souls, for the most part, they're not going to be deeply touched unless yours has been first. We see so many families come through Snowbird every year, and so many kids have God-fearing, involved parents that do not invest in the discipleship of their kids. That's it. They're involved. They're there. But they're not teaching, man. Disobedience isn't always doing something bad. Sometimes it's doing nothing. And so maybe the challenge we need to hear this morning is it's time to get in the game. If we're going to be faithful stewards right here, a steward doesn't do nothing. Like, we got to get off our tails and lead in obedience, too. Like, your kid's watching how you walk. We put so much effort into financial stability and competency and, you know, at competency at work. But do you exhaust yourself in the word and in the discipleship of your kids? Do we labor to lead our families? Because often we see our kids outrunning us in obedience. That can happen sometimes. Uh, I woke up late the other morning and watched and saw my son reading his Bible in his room. I was like, not again. Because I'm happy for that. Sometimes you need a push in the back, right? But... Man, I need to be leading. That shouldn't be the norm. Let me cast a quick vision, and I'm, I'm running out of time. 2 Timothy 2. Cast a quick vision. Paul's talking to Timothy, his son in the faith. He says, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus, and what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul's talking to Timothy, his son in his faith, and says, teach other men, they'll be my grandsons in the faith, who will be able to teach others also, who will be my great-grandsons in the faith. Y'all, that could be you. Think about, man, what this church can produce as far as disciples. Man, I, I would have loved to have met Daniel's parents. Think about Hezekiah as a parent. Daniel at 15 resolves not to defile himself 
And that carries on until he's in his 80s. We see him before Bel- Belshazzar, the king, in his 80s, faithfully following Yahweh. What happened from 1 to 15? Because it was for real. Man, students, y'all need to know you're stepping into a hostile culture that hates you. They do. They hated Jesus. They hate you. But just like God was with Daniel in exile, God's with you. Like, and if you're a Christian, he's in you. So, yeah, we need to finish well. How do you finish well? You look to Daniel, for sure. He's 15. God used him to change the world. God can use you. But we also look to Christ, primarily. Hebrews 12. I'm going to close with this verse, I think. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. Listen, students. Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. How do you finish well? You look to Jesus. You look to Christ. He's started your faith. He will finish it. That's a promise from him. But part of the way he finishes is, is that we look to him. There's no victory. There's no finishing well apart from Christ. There's no obedience apart from Christ. And thanks be to God, he's with us in this exile. Parents, he's with you as you parent. You can do this. You can do it. It doesn't take much. And part of the way that you, parents, finish well, if we look at Hezekiah's example, is by investing in the next generation. Let's pray. Jesus, thanks for these men and women. Thanks for these Teenagers, for these kids, thank you for this church. God, I pray that you would challenge us from your word to be investing in this next generation, Lord. I pray that for these guys, they'd be a church that invests, that we would each, me included, I need to hear this, that we'd all be parents that invest in our kids' spiritual lives. Lord, please empower us to do that task. I pray that we'd be faithful stewards that, uh, that would be faithfully shepherding and holding forth the mysteries to our, to our kids. Lord Jesus, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen.